Good day, I'm Kimberly Wright and welcome to News Rewind. JNN's look at the top stories of the week that was. New statistics from the Jamaica Constabulary Force JCF indicate that murders are still on the rise. Details in this report. The latest data from the Jamaica Constabulary Force show that murders are still climbing in most police divisions outside of the states of emergency in St. James and the St. Catherine North Division. For the period January 1 to April 14, 411 people, including 14 children, were murdered. This was up from 399 during the corresponding period last year. St. James has so far recorded 25 murders compared to 78 during the similar period last year, a 67% reduction. 51 murders were reported in the St. Catherine North Division, up from 40 in 2017, a 27% increase. There has, however, been a drastic reduction in murders and shootings in the division since the state of emergency was declared on March 18. In the St. Andrew South Division, there were 60 murders, representing a 252% increase. Portland recorded a 400% increase with five murders. Kingston Eastern, 77%, St. Thomas, 71%, St. Mary, 85%, and Trelawney, 75%. Westmoreland recorded 47 murders, the highest in rural Jamaica. That was a 12% increase over last year. In the Kingston Western Division, where a zone of special operations is in effect in Denham Town, there was a 7% reduction in murders. The public is again being reminded that the police need its help in fighting crime. People are being urged to report any acts of crime and violence to the police. The security forces continue to grapple with crime, even more so when it occurs in an area where their presence is heightened. One such area is Denham Town where the guns barked again Wednesday evening, snuffing out the lives of two residents. Michael Sharp picks up that story. The zone of special operations in Denham Town is not looking so special these days. The flashing lights of the police vehicles in the Golden Heights community underscores this, another crime scene. A JDF helicopter with searchlight circles the troubled zone. Shortly after 6 p.m. on Wednesday, a group of persons were playing football along this street. A motor vehicle drove by and gunmen opened fire, hitting four persons. One woman was killed on the spot, 58-year-old Higler Jennifer Bruce, while 20-year-old Tahaj Gordon, alias Fretdem, died at the Kingston Public Hospital while undergoing treatment. A tense calm filled the area as the security forces pumped more human resources to stem any reprisal, at least for now. JDF helicopter above giving aerial support to the men on the ground in the Golden Heights community in a Zosa area of Denham Town. So far, five persons have died since the Zosa started here, and the police at this time are trying to put the pieces together, a number of spent shells on the ground, and two lives lost. The crime rate continues to make things bad for Jamaica, especially in terms of prospective investors. One such tale was related by Chief Executive Officer of Jamaican Teas, John Mafood, at his annual general meeting on Wednesday. Cody and Barrett has that story. Mr. Mafood continues to point to the inhibiting role that crime has on our local economy, which has not shown growth over 2% over the last five years. To bring home his point, he told the AGM about a recent conversation he had with a foreign investor. And in, he indicated that he wanted to start a factory in Jamaica. Um, and he was, his problem was he had a great idea, he had a great product, but he couldn't find financing in the U.S. market. And, he, you know, he said that Jamaica is not a favored place for investors because they see it as a high-risk area high corruption, high crime, and some risk to your capital. Um, I believe the high crime is, is one of the biggest inhibitors to the economy. 
Jamaican teas continues to show healthy increases over the years, growing both in terms of shareholders in the company and in its profit margins. The company also continues to see an increase in its export market. The CEO, however, pointed to disappointment in its orchid estate in St. Thomas, which is now complete. We lost a f a quite a bit of money on that project, um, mostly due to uh, large, significant delays in getting various approvals from local, the local government, from uh, issuing of titles, from uh, property tax uh, delays in the, in, in the um, delays in uh, finalizing property tax and so on. Uh, we experienced, I think, about a two-year delay in that project in completing it, and that impacted greatly on the cost and the fact that uh, we, we, we got tied into certain selling prices that were too low. He told the shareholders that the company will not be involved in low-cost housing in the future, especially outside of Kingston. A policeman has been hospitalized after he was chopped in the face by a man said to be of unsound mind in Christiana, Manchester, Tuesday morning. Please be advised that you may find the following images disturbing. Viewer discretion is recommended. More in this story by Michael Sharp. Frontline News has obtained graphic videos of the incident as it happened. First, the policeman seen on this closed circuit video is driving his motorcycle when the man, said to be of unsound mind, attacks him. The lawman is thrown from the motorcycle. Even then, his attacker continues to pounce on him. The policeman runs off with his attacker in pursuit. In his defense, the police opens fire unfortunately hitting an 18-year-old bystander. His condition is unknown. Residents then come to the assistance of the bloodied policeman. The perpetrator is subdued by the residents until other police personnel arrive, dragging him off. The injured cop was taken to the Percy Junior Hospital, where he underwent emergency surgery. For the second time in two weeks, counterfeit goods amounting to over $100 million were seized by a team from the Counterterrorism and Organized Crime Unit, CTOC. Cody and Barrett has that story. The CTOC team swooped down on two wholesale stores, Coastal City Clothing and Shoes, located at 133A and 133B Barry Street in downtown Kingston. The two stores are operated by Chinese nationals who have breached three statutes under the Consumer Protection, Trademark and Customs Duty Acts. CTOC notes that the counterfeit goods, also called knockoffs, rob the government of taxes as a result of the undervaluation. They also threaten the owners of the authentic goods to stop operating in light of the unfair competition. Frontline News also learned that in an attempt to avoid prosecution, some store owners have been moving some of the goods. If convicted, the Chinese national face a fine of up to a million dollars and or jail time based on the discretion of the judge. Additionally, under the Customs Act, they could be fined up to three times the real value of the goods. With this second operation, CTOC has so far seized goods valued at over $600 million. Following the legal process, the goods will be destroyed. Public defender Arlene Harrison Henry is calling for an end to the state of public emergency in St. James. She believes it has not achieved its targets. Abigail Smythe has the details. Mrs. Harrison Henry wants the state of public emergency in St. James to come to an immediate end. She says it has not met its goals. Instead, it has only been a means of unlawfully detaining the country's youth. She also bemoans the undesirable circumstances many innocent residents of St. James have had to endure while being detained. Mrs. Harrison Henry says, quote, I believe the state of public emergency ought to come rapidly to an end and the earlier the better. It can't enhance good relationships between citizens and the security forces, end quote. She notes that dealing with persons who have had their sons detained has been especially painful. 
She condemns what is being called a mass detention of males ranging from ages 17 to 30. The public defender notes that of the 1,774 persons taken into custody, only 104 persons have been charged for offenses including murder. Most others have however been released. Mrs. Harrison Henry argues that having persons spending up to five days in custody with only less than 10% charged has serious consequences. She reiterates that this is wrong. On the other hand, newly appointed National Security Minister Dr. Horace Chang asserts that the state of public emergency is indeed turning out results. Dr. Chang says, quote, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. The critical fact to look at is not the number of people charged so far. We have reduced murders by some 60% in St. James. What you are seeking to do is restore stability. Once you restore stability, which was the purpose of the enhanced security measures, you will restore confidence in the police. End quote. St. James has been under a state of emergency since January 18, and it's to be in effect till May 2. The police high command has raised concerns about calls for an end to the state of emergency. The high command says the measure has proven to be effective and has saved at least 54 lives since its inception in St. James. Michael Sharp has more. The police high command's statement comes following the public defender's call for an immediate end to the state of emergency in St. James. The police say they have been receiving positive feedback and that the greatest concern among residents is the premature ending of the state of emergency. It says the residents say this is the safest they have felt in years. The High Command reports that there is a steady rebuilding of public trust towards the police across several communities in St. James, and the fear of crime, while not totally removed, has greatly subsided. The public defender, Arlene Harrison Henry, had said she believes the state of emergency in St. James has not achieved its targets. She expressed that it has only been a means of unlawfully detaining the country's youth. On the other hand, the I Command notes that the operations protect the human rights of the people. It states that this has been done through the training of the security forces, the responsiveness of the High Command to complaints, and open dialogue among the High Command, the public defender, and other human rights groups. It asserts that the publication of those named as most wanted in the parish does not negate the reality that hundreds of others remain persons of interest as criminal influencers and facilitators, as well as for their involvement in other lesser crimes. To date, 18 of those who were wanted have been arrested, all of whom peacefully surrendered to the security forces and have been brought before the court. The High Command reports that to date, 1,724 persons have been processed since the start of the state of emergency in St. James. Of that number, 133 have been charged, with 56 being charged with major crimes to include 22 for murder, 19 for shooting, 12 for robbery, and 6 for rape. There were major concerns about the number of persons being detained and the chances of their livelihood being affected. The police, however, note that once it is established that persons who are detained and processed are legitimately and gainfully employed, Every effort is exerted to contact the relatives and employers of those persons to preserve their employment. The police are also again reassuring members of the public that the detention of persons and the operations under the state of emergency are being carried out in accordance with established principles of citizens' safety and security and the maintenance of human rights and dignity. Confusion is mounting after the British government said it is deciding to destroy thousands of landing card slips that recorded the arrival of Windrush generation immigrants into the UK. Cody and Barrett has the details. I want to apologise to you today uh, because we are genuinely sorry for any anxiety that has been caused. Despite Theresa May's apology to the 12 Caribbean heads of government for the treatment of Windrush citizens and promises that no one would be deported, the British government is defending its decision. 
Officials said disposing of documents had been the right move to make, while the Home Office said keeping them could have broken data protection laws. However, the Labour Party said the destruction of the registration slips was shocking and blamed the fiasco on the Home Office. A Home Office spokesman said while the registration slips provided details of an individual's date of entry, they did not provide any reliable evidence relating to ongoing residence in the UK or immigration status. The UK Prime Minister's official spokesman said the decision was made to securely dispose of the documents. When asked if Theresa May was aware of the disposal while she was Home Secretary, the Prime Minister's spokesman said it was an operational decision that was made by the Border Agency. In the meantime, British officials are investigating dozens of new migration cases relating to the Windrush generation amid mounting criticisms of the government. The Home Office said it was looking at 49 cases as a result of calls since Tuesday. Changes to migration rules mean those who lack documents are now being told they need evidence to continue working, accessing key services, or even remaining in the UK. A task force and helpline have been established for people affected. We take a break. News Rewind will be right back with the top business stories. Welcome back to News Rewind. Now for the top business stories of the past week. I'm Kimberly Wright. Private sector leaders say that their organizations are prepared to integrate the 10-digit telephone dialing sequence that is due to come on stream later this year, along with the introduction of an international area code number 658. More in this report. The current area code 876 is almost exhausted and requires an additional code or numbering plan area, NPA, which will come into effect at midnight on May 31, 2018. The change effectively makes the dialing of local numbers a mandatory 10-digit. According to spokesperson for the Office of Utilities Regulations, OUR, Elizabeth Bennett Marsh, while this will bring Jamaica in line with most of the world, it no doubt will create some amount of disruption, primarily to the business sector. However, President of the Private Sector Organization of Jamaica, PSOJ, Howard Mitchell, believes that the changes are unlikely to pose any major disruptions. He said that with most people using smartphones that are capable of adjusting to specific commands as well as other smart technology, getting accustomed to a 10-digit dialing sequence should be of little concern. Telecommunications providers Flow and Digicel are advising non-smartphone users to start editing local numbers in their contact list to reflect the 876 area code before the seven-digit phone numbers as there is no facility for them to do it otherwise. In contrast, smartphone users will have the advantage of utilizing applications or apps that can update a person's mobile phone contact list by automatically adding the area code. Flow's communications director, Kayon Wallace, is encouraging non-smartphone users to start the process of updating their contact database immediately in order to ensure that they will not suffer any inconvenience once they switch to the mandatory format. While large and impressive buildings are going up in downtown Kingston, the issue of the lack of public parking is a sobering reality. This issue was brought up at the annual general meeting of Jamaican Tees at the Pegasus Hotel on Wednesday. More in this report. More in this report. The Grace Kennedy and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs are now under construction, as well as the digital office, are examples of the expansion of downtown Kingston. However, the lack of adequate public parking downtown has led at least one company to make a strategic decision in light of this reality. Jamaican Tees have gone the route of investing in real estate along Harbour Street for storage space. Chief Executive Officer John Mafuda told his AGM why they made such a move. Those construction projects don't come with excess parking. They come for, with parking for their own projects. So what we, are, what we really need downtown is public parking. And until that happens, we are going to be very limited in what type in in, um, 
in people taking up those empty buildings that are all along Harbor Street and Hanover Street and, and so on. Uh, so what we have done is we have bought these small buildings and we have rented them out as warehouse space because warehouse space doesn't require uh, a lot of parking and we are able to buy the product, the, the real estate projects um, at a price that will allow even um, renting for warehousing to give us a reasonable return. The Jamaican Tea CEO is hopeful that in time, things will change. In time, we will see um, uh, additional parking being built downtown and we'll be able to convert some of those properties we have bought into office buildings or other commercial property. And that's your News Rewind for this week. I'm Kimberly Wright. Thanks for watching.